It's the case that's horrifying a nation. Where is Samantha Murphy? A missing mum who's just going for a jog. The questions, the clues. A great place to conceal a body. And the digital evidence that may solve this mystery. She's getting tracked by a range of different ways. It's almost like we're running with her. Our investigation starts now. Good evening, I'm Liz Hayes, and this is Under Investigation. This story begins in Ballarat, Victoria. It's 7 a.m. on Sunday, the 4th of February. The last known image of Samantha Murphy, provided by police, shows her outside her home before she sets out on her regular morning job. She was meant to be back by 11 for brunch, but never returned. Instead, the 51-year-old mother of three ran to an unknown end. It's our number one investigation at present. Her disappearance is now the focus of a massive police operation. We're looking at absolutely everything and every possible scenario. It's a case that may turn on a single clue. And that's what we're chasing. For somebody to just vanish out of life in a community, people feel it. And they also sort of, well, deep down, they think it could happen to any one of us. Joining our investigation tonight, former Victorian detective, Damien Merritt. Missing person specialist, Valentine Smith. Forensic psychologist, Dr. Peter Ashka. And speaking to us exclusively tonight, Sissy Austin, who ran the same trails as Samantha Murphy and who survived a brutal ambush attack in the same area. We're both women, we're both runners, and I don't think it's unreasonable to assume that Sam's disappearance is a result of men's violence. Tonight, we'll examine the scenarios that might account for Samantha's disappearance. And for our special investigation, we've also travelled to the town at the heart of this mystery, Ballarat, to see firsthand where Samantha went missing. I think a 13K run she was going for. She usually does 20Ks and takes about two hours. So she was going to do half of that. Damien Merritt's mission here is to talk to the locals and investigate why someone might want to target Samantha Murphy. Well, how long before she disappeared would that be? Valentine Smith will examine the forest trails that so many women in Ballarat take on their daily run. This is a perfect spot for an ambush as she's coming through here. Someone could be hiding off here to the right. I think there could be like anywhere between four and 5,000 gold mines just underneath the town. And we're joined by Raymond Shaw, a renowned mineshaft explorer. He knows the bush and the countless abandoned mines in the area. And he's been helping in the search for Samantha. That's the hole of Ballarat underneath. It's incredible. I mean, you know, four or 5,000, that's like putting it lightly. Yeah, yeah. I believe there's a lot more. A lot more. That's amazing. Well, I've had a look at the maps too, uh, so mm. I think we're good to go. Together, our team will build a picture on the ground of the day Samantha went missing and what or who she may have encountered. Has Samantha lost her way? Has she had a medical episode? Has she had an accident? Or has there been some human intervention? There are all possibilities. So what do we know about the woman whose face has become so terribly familiar to us all? Samantha and her family have strong local connections in Ballarat. She and her husband Mick have three children and the couple own and operate a car smash repair business. 
Samantha is a dedicated mother, and according to her daughter Jess, someone who would fight fiercely to be back with her family. Mum's a really strong woman, and she's far too determined to give up this fight. I know she's out there somewhere, so if you could please continue to search for her, to give us something to work with, we'd really appreciate it. Mum, we love you so much and we miss you. And we need you at home with us. <laughs> For our experts, tonight is about grappling with scenarios that might explain Samantha's disappearance, the theories which police have had to probe. Please come home soon. I... And for forensic psychologist Peter Ashkar, the first is whether Samantha Murphy staged her own disappearance. Peter, this is a, a daughter who is obviously quite connected to her mother. So the, the thought that she might have just wandered off uh, or made a decision to leave, which is one of a potential theory, is hard to uh, fathom. As we all know in our hearts, mothers do not leave their children except under very extreme, unusual circumstances. The daughter is clearly very attached uh, to a mother and by um, on that basis, I would assume that the mother's also very attached to her. So the idea that Samantha has actually um, willfully left the family is just unfathomable and uh, just implausible to me. And it's clearly not what the community of Ballarat believes. A strong showing of support as the search for the mother of three began for another day. Turning out in their hundreds to search for Samantha, day after day, now week after week. And Sissy Austin has been one of them. Let's talk about Samantha and give her a bit of a voice here. From all reports, she was highly connected to the community. She was involved in the community. Yeah, I'm really conscious of not speaking on behalf of Samantha, but um, yeah, definitely Samantha's, you know, close friends, family, community. You know, I met someone out on the search last week who used to ser serve Sam her wraps daily in the restaurant, who was in tears out there searching for her. So it's like extended beyond family, friends. It's down to, the, you know, people that have served Sam her food, her coffee in the community that are out there searching. Which says a lot about her. It says there are a lot of people in this community that felt for her and felt great empathy and, yep, and yep. connection to yeah. Even if you didn't know her, you thought a connection. Yeah, a lot of people are placing themselves in Samantha's shoes and also, you know, Samantha's family's shoes and really putting themselves out there to find Sam. Like many of those searching, Sissy Austin doesn't know Samantha personally, but the trauma of being viciously attacked while also jogging almost exactly a year ago compels her to help find Samantha. It was a really hard time for me, given it was the anniversary of my attack. But with my pain and my hurt, I felt that, you know, the best thing to do with that energy that I was experiencing in my body was to, you know, be out there and assisting with the search as, as best as I can. So, you know, whilst it's been really hard, it's, um, I, I don't, you know, regret it. No. And I'll be, I'll be back out there <laughs> once I'm finished here. Tonight, Sissy's own terrible experience will help inform our experts and our investigation into what happened to Samantha Murphy. We know Samantha loved running and she was training for a 21 kilometre fun run. Most mornings she set out on a hearty 10 to 15 kilometre job. She took her iPhone, wore an Apple Watch and we understand AirPods. But on the ground, there's a unique and troubling feature of the terrain around Ballarat that perhaps opens a tragic window into this mystery. The thousands of disused mine shafts. In this awful situation, if Samantha has found herself in a mine, mm -hmm. the chances of making a call for help are limited? Are very limited. No one's gonna hear you crying for help. There's no phone, there's nothing. It's very dark, damp down there. Makes me feel terrible. Yeah, makes you feel sick to the stomach. Coming up. If you fell down, your chances of survival? Would be very, very slim. 
The death traps, just off the track. It might be a very convenient place to dispose of a body. You'd probably never find it again. Was Samantha running scared? This is a perfect spot for an ambush here. That's next on Under Investigation. Did you hear that sound? Tonight, we're investigating the mysterious and increasingly sinister disappearance of mother of three, Samantha Murphy, who vanished while on her morning job. We need you at home with us. Please come home soon. I can't wait to see you. The case that has Australia bracing for the worst, but still hoping for the best. Everyone in relation to Samantha is a person of interest. Um, in our investigation, we are speaking to everyone that was in her life. We're examining all the possibilities police have had to consider. The idea that Samantha has actually willfully left the family is just unfathomable and just implausible to me. We're both women, we're both runners, and I don't think it's unreasonable to assume that Sam's disappearance is a result of men's violence. Ballarat, Samantha Murphy's hometown, carries a dark and violent past. It's hard to see the light shining so bright. The Eureka Stockade and the Rebellion, bloody confrontations between miners and authorities during Australia's biggest gold rush in the mid-1800s. So this is littered with gold mines? Correct. It left the district pitted with thousands of deep and deadly shafts and tunnels. And it's possible one of these may hold the secret to Samantha Murphy's fate. It can be semi-collapsed, full of foliage, or, you know, that foliage on top can take you down to the depths of like about 40 or 60 metres. It's the concern of mineshaft expert Raymond Shaw. And if you fell down, yep. your chances of survival? Would be very, very slim on a deep one. You'd probably break your neck, you know, the first few metres into it. Some shafts can be as deep as 100 metres, where the air is barely breathable. This is a terrible question, but um, if, uh, if Samantha Murphy is in a mine shaft in this region, what are the chances of finding her? Probably Buckley's and none. It's very difficult to like walk around the terrain out here and, you know, cover every little bit of, you know, oh. surface workings. It's absolutely impossible. Damien, they offer a unique part to this mystery, don't they? Well, they do. Um, look, they could be a great place to um, conceal a body or a crime after the fact. If something did happen in that uh, park, uh, foul play, um, you know, you could put stuff down that uh, mine shaft, including a body, and you'd probably never find it again. Investigating Samantha's disappearance, the police have had to grapple with a number of possible scenarios, including whether she could have fallen into a mine shaft by accident. Although Sissy Austin believes that's almost impossible. Local joggers, she says, are well aware of the dangers, especially if you deviate off the track. Everyone who's grown up in Ballarat, and particularly a mother who's raised children in Ballarat, would, you know, know about the mine shafts. Obviously, like, you don't go off the tracks. And when I've been out searching for Sam, but the only time you do go off the track potentially is to, like, go to the toilet if, as a runner. All the locals know how to navigate the terrain without falling down a mine shaft. Peter Rashkar. Of course, um, the psychology of a community knows about mine shafts. They know that, that they're dangerous. From a psychological perspective, Samantha was an experienced runner. She knew the area very well. She was running during daylight hours. I certainly agree with Damien that it might be a very convenient place to dispose of a body if something like that has occurred, but certainly would not expect an experienced runner like Samantha to have accidentally fallen down one. Police have also had to consider whether Samantha has suffered a sudden medical event or even a snake bite. Damien, reasonable? No, because I think she'd be uh, smart enough to stay in the same position on the track. Yeah, and even as we've been searching, you, there's phone service everywhere. Like, it's not completely out of town. There's no point where 
our phones have gone to like SOS only. And even if she um, was to have a uh, health issue like a heart attack, I mean, you don't, you're, you're not going to crawl into the bush. That's like crawling away to die, you know, because, you know, you, your only chance is for somebody to come along those tracks. And seeing the tracks Samantha ran, it's clear this is not remote bushland. I'm still surprised at how easy and open the run is. And so I'm, I am thinking for, for something to go wrong, it has to be major for you not to be found. Absolutely. We're never far from a road, which makes her complete disappearance, despite nearly three weeks of intensive searching, deeply suspicious to missing persons expert Valentine Smith. The cover is there in places I know, but it's still quite wide open. They had a lot of searches in here, and there's searches going on today, as we know. Some very experienced people in here today. Yeah. And the dogs they had here were exceptional. And nothing. Mm. Nothing. Which I find very, very unusual. But Valentine believes it is possible Samantha would leave the track if she'd been suddenly confronted. This is a perfect spot for an ambush. Someone who's had her running for her life. Someone could be hiding off here to the right and, and as she's sort of coming through here and then jump out in front of a whack. What a spot right here. Would not have a hope. If Samantha was attacked, that scenario brings with it some chilling assumptions. Someone who targeted, possibly stalked, and almost certainly followed Samantha that morning. Just as happened to Sissy Austin almost 12 months before in the same area. This is what happens when you go for a run in the bush in Ballarat. On February the 11th last year, on her usual jog, Sissy was ambushed by a barefoot man she barely saw, striking her viciously with a rock and leaving her for dead. Once I'd been knocked unconscious, it wasn't until I got back to my car, I was searching for my phone and realised that I actually had my phone on me the entire time. And it's, I, I, it's not something that crossed my mind at all when I was trying to find my way back after being knocked unconscious. So I think it's because I was trying to get out there. It was cause, probably because I was scared, like I was disorientated. Well, you're, you're, you're escaping an attacker. Yeah. You know, you're out there, you're jogging, it's early morning, it's hot, yeah. and you've been attacked and seriously injured. Yeah. It's exactly. an insight into yeah. what potentially Samantha might have faced. Yeah, and I don't want to make assumptions of what, you know, Samantha's gone through. It's my own experience that I've, you know, um, mostly kept to myself throughout these last two weeks, but it's, like, definitely a place where my mind is continuously, um, you know, wandering. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Valentine, uh, that is, um, as difficult as that is, that's a great insight for mm. uh, what happens out there in that situation. I just thank you for sharing it with us. Just a, a question um, in relation to your attacker. The attacker you reported was barefoot? Yeah. Okay. I think that's very interesting. I mean, who walks through terrain, forest terrain, uh, barefoot? Uh, and the hypothesis that I would draw from that is you typically see people with serious mental illness uh, unclothed, dishevelled, not wearing shoes. So that's the first thing that comes to my mind about your description of your attacker. Sissy was ambushed near the halfway point of her regular run, where she planned to go back. An indication, perhaps, that her attacker knew her routine. I knew in my mind that I was doing 8Ks that day and I knew that I had my watch and I knew at the 4K point that that's where I'd turn around and run back and I was almost at the 4K point. When I was attacked, I hadn't quite made the turnaround. 4Ks. So, yeah. The point at which Sissy was attacked has a chilling parallel in what we now know of Samantha's disappearance. She'd apparently planned a 15 kilometre jog that day. But according to police, data obtained from her iPhone and Apple Watch indicates she only made seven kilometres. 
what would have been close to the halfway mark in her run. They've analysed that data and something's happened at that seven kilometre point that is so significant that they believe that's the point that something happened. And from this moment on, it seems Samantha Murphy is in trouble. We have to assume, do we, that someone knew that she was on that run that morning? Somebody either knew where she'd run past and waited, or there were more than one person. One was behind following, uh, another one was waiting up further, um, or, you know, she was followed in there. What I believe is this was targeted and seven kilometres in, an incident has happened, and obviously that's uh, a pretty important incident because that's where police have told us that um, she got to, and that's where searches are continuing. So what happened after that and who was involved? Coming up... They will slip under the radar and appear no different to anyone else in the community. The case for a psychopath. Who else had access to apps on her phone? A predator with a plan. They would be able to see where she was moving and how she was moving. It just feels like a targeted attack. That's next on Under Investigation. We are the hunters. Samantha Murphy loved jogging. But on Sunday morning, February the 4th, she literally ran out of sight. And at the seven kilometre mark, digital data from her Apple Watch and iPhone indicates something occurred. They've analysed that data and something's happened at that seven kilometre point that is so significant that they believe that's the point that something happened. For our experts tonight, there are a number of difficult areas to examine, including whether Samantha has been attacked, and if so, the inescapable question, who's responsible? And there are two options. The two main hypotheses that we'd want to follow and, and test, if it's not someone they know, it's going to be someone who's operating perhaps under a psychotic delusion or somebody who is actually a psychopathic predator. We've looked at the parallels. The attack Sissy Austin suffered almost a year before while also jogging. Sissy was ambushed and viciously beaten by a man midway through her run. And as it's believed with Samantha, Sissy too was wearing earphones. How can you get 7Ks down the track and not necessarily know someone's behind you? Um, would your earphones disconnect you from other sounds? Yeah, they could. I think like it, it could be that. It could be there's a certain feeling that you have when you're running where you feel like you're on top of the world and you can't feel anything else around you other than hearing your own breath, hearing your feet on the track. And sometimes that's all you're you know, focused on. Yeah, so you're in runner. tune with your own body, so you... Then an, another important thing to know is, like, as women, often, we can feel if something doesn't feel right. And um, that's also, like, really important to acknowledge, you know, even walking down the street, even, you know, going somewhere at night, you can sense if something isn't feeling right or if someone is following you. But if it's somewhere that's been a place of safety, like I certainly, before like my attack, wouldn't have been looking over my shoulder. You provide such an incredible insight into the experience of running through that forest. If Samantha had cause for concern, became worried about noises or her experience of running, my question is this, why did she not call someone? She's a strong woman. She runs a lot, she's very fit. It's her psychology that she's in control and she's... She but you can... know, in times of fear, like, you f can freeze. Yes. You f like, I, I, I personally forgot that I had my phone on right. me. Um, did something happen so quickly that there was actually no time to call someone? And in terms of a predator, do you surmise that they've checked out the location? If it is the case that Samantha has been involved or preyed upon by a 
predator. If they were the psychopathic type of predator, they would uh, know that area like the back of their hand. And as he sifts through the information, forensic psychologist Dr Peter Ashkar can't dismiss an early hunch. If I were to, you know, lay my cards on the table, it would be towards it being a very organised and planned psychopathic predator. They're usually very damaged psychologically. They're cold, they're callous, they're bold, they're daring. They're usually very intelligent. Very often they will slip under the radar and appear no different to anyone else in the community, and that allows them to get very close to the victims. And, and why the question for our experts is, are the two cases, the attack on Sissy and the disappearance of Samantha, connected? I see it like this. You've got Sissy's case. You investigate that case. You investigate this case. And if they connect, you connect. You, and if they connect, hmm. you just keep an open mind. Yeah, we're not saying that, um, you know, you can't connect the cases. No. What we're saying is, that not, there's not enough to suggest that it's possibly the same person. Cruelly, Sissy Austin is still waiting for justice and for the man who attacked her to be identified. But our team believes it's more likely he's not involved in Samantha Murphy's disappearance. And there remains one other painful scenario that she's fallen victim to someone known to her. Someone perhaps with a grudge against her or her family, who has turned hate or anger into a terrible act. Someone who may be seeking a solution to a problem. It's the scenario veteran detective Damien Merritt is turning to. If something happens to a victim, uh, whether it's a disappearance, a murder. The first thing the police are going to do is build up what's called victimology. And that is what that person was, has been up to in their life, every single aspect of it. The police are going to analyse their social media, their devices, the schedule they kept, uh, where they worked, who they associated with, where they've been lately. And then that goes on to the relationships that they have in their life. You've got to look at everything. The eerily precise location police have identified at the seven kilometre point in Samantha's run suggests to Damien this could well be a targeted attack by someone who knew or had access to Samantha's movements. Who else had access to apps on her phone like Find My Phone and so good forth? Good point, very good point. So she could have been being tracked without those people having to physically surveil her. When we look at this particular track, Liz, incredibly amount of resources searching it. Having viewed the local bush and the running trails and spoken with the locals, probed all the scenarios, the same theories police have had to investigate, our experts agree Samantha Murphy has most likely fallen victim to foul play. People just don't disappear without good reason. And they also believe there is a high probability she has been taken by those who may have tracked and ambushed her. It just feels like a targeted attack. Somebody who intimately knew the tracks that she takes or had access to be able to track her runs. The final answers may lie in critical evidence our experts are about to examine. Coming up, from the second that she walked out of her door, she's getting tracked by a range of different ways. The revelations. It's almost like we're running with her. From Samantha's digital trail. It was an anomaly, a change in the behaviour of what the device was collecting. How reliable is that? Very precise, down to, down to the metres. That's next on Under Investigation. Accident, predator, or someone she knew. They are the scenarios for one of Australia's most unsettling missing persons cases in recent years. The mystery of what happened to Samantha Murphy. We've got a lady who went missing in a rural area and there's been no trace of her thus far, so 
It is a complex investigation. Well, as this case is developing, the digital data from Samantha's devices is becoming more and more important. Former detective Nigel Fair, who headed investigations at the Australian High Tech Crime Centre, has been studying Samantha Murphy's digital trail. We're joined by Nigel Fair. He joins us in the studio tonight. Nigel, thank you. Samantha Murphy's disappearance seems to be relying now heavily on data. Yes, Liz. Digital evidence will form the primacy of the police investigation. All their avenues of inquiry will start with digital evidence and indeed it'll flow all the way through to any subsequent prosecution that they may take. As she went out that morning, Samantha had two incredibly powerful devices mapping and tracking a range of digital data. Her iPhone, whose location can be accurately triangulated by the multiple cell towers in the area. And her Apple Watch, measuring her biometrics, heart rate, stride length, even if she has had a fall. It's almost like we're running with her. Is that what you're suggesting? Yes, from the second that she walked out of her door, when out on the street, it would be able to see where she was moving and how she was moving and they would be able to understand as she moved into the forest, her altitude changes, and then that might relay to different stride lengths. And both devices generate precise GPS data, technically able to place her within a few metres. It's information police have been quietly gathering since their investigation began. But now we know a critical fact. From what I'm understanding, it was probably at that seven kilometre mark that there has been some different pattern. All was seemingly normal for Samantha until she reached this seven kilometre point. But then there was apparently a disturbance. Her biometric data and other digital evidence speaks to an incident, something presumably related to her disappearance. Approximately an hour after she left home, she reached the Mount Clear area. And that evidence most likely a package of telltale information, including the last registered contact from her iPhone, the last digital ping, has refocused the police investigation and search. That search is based potentially on the last known ping. Yes, either the last known ping or the last known ping where there was normal activity. If she's running at a constant speed and we know that she was a fit person, the other data being stride length and those type of things, heart rate was all constant, then I think at that stage there was an anomaly, a change in the behaviour of what the device was collecting. How reliable is that? That's... Hugely reliable. And, and precise? Very precise, down to, down to the metres. If they've had this data, you think, from the start, why has it taken 18 days for us to search a, the seven kilometre point? It's a really good question putting my uh, ex-police hat on, maybe they wanted to see if the perpetrators went back to that spot. Good answer. Nigel Fair believes the sudden absence of digital data from Samantha's devices is not only a powerful pointer to the possibility something sinister has occurred, it could also be an insight to a predator's sophisticated technical knowledge. I'm intrigued if everything stopped at that seven kilometre mark and we just have nothing. That means someone's done something active against those two devices and you have to know what you're doing to think, I'm going to completely take these out. It's not just turning them off, it's destroying them and then getting rid of that piece of evidence. Tell me, Nigel, is it possible that the towers and this acquired data tell us if the phone and the devices are being moved and carried by someone other than Samantha? I, well, it, it can if we relay it with existing run data of hers. Nigel says criminals have been known to remove or replace the SIM card in an iPhone. But the mobile can still be tracked because each phone has an individual identification number, a hardware code called IMI. Even if you've passed that phone on and you cleared it all, would it send out the IME? And how did they track that without a number? A device has two signifiers. It has the phone number, which you can change. Um, call that the software 
signifier and then it has a hardware identifier, which is the IMI number. And that's what will always remain the same regardless of how you clean the phone, it always has its hardware signifier. It means police have been able to track the movements of Samantha's phone, even if it's been cleared of the SIM card and taken from her. Regardless if you swap SIMs or don't use a SIM at all and just use it as a, as a Wi-Fi only device in a Wi-Fi area, it will always broadcast that IME number onto the network. And it isn't only Samantha's digital footprint police can track. Investigators can also detect the data of others in the same location. And that includes digital devices predators might have with them, including technology built into a car. If we can track Samantha's device into an area, what other devices were in that area at that same time? And it would be, I would argue, quite a sophisticated criminal would think not to bring their own digital evidence into that type of crime scene. Digital data and its intricate detail has focused the investigation. And it's given police incredible information, including that something happened seven kilometres into Samantha's run. But it doesn't bode well that the search for Samantha is continuing. If there is not a sign of Samantha there, not a body, what does it tell us? I think it tells us that she's been moved, um, whether it's a long way or a short way, whether it's down a mine shaft, whether it's to some other location. The, the other thing is, is there any parts of, of her devices there? Either they've been broken and there's some remnants, or they've been thrown down the mine shaft, or they've been carried off. Um, the best thing going really for police would be if they weren't disabled and they were just carried away. And there also might be other forensic material there, like there could be blood, there could be Absolutely. a weapon. P pieces of material, torn material. Yep. As we know, Liz, she's a fighter, so there, there could be a, a, you know, a fight that's gone on. From your knowledge, from what you've investigated and seen, is there a probable scenario that you would lean towards as to what has happened to Samantha Murphy? I think she's met with foul play by at least two other people at that location, at that seven kilometre location in or around there. And how likely is it that police have the data on potential predators and uh, police are tracking those predators too? I think it's highly likely. Yeah. Um, how important do you see this, uh, Valentine, the digital trail? Oh, it's of uh, incredible importance. Digital data and its ability to draw us closer to finding Samantha is extraordinary. But missing persons expert Valentine Smith believes that the most potent investigative resource is still the general public. And he implores everyone to remain motivated and involved. It's important that the, the community listen to what's being said here uh, tonight and to really focus on, on what's happened and make notes and think and report it to the police and report it to Crime Stoppers. That's what it's there for. Coming up. There'll be more than that one person that knows what's happened. A crucial clue. This is so important because they didn't just say a car, they said a damaged car. Is a breakthrough imminent? A resolution that finds peace in our hearts and allows for healing. That's next on Under Investigation. Tonight, we're investigating the fate of Samantha Murphy, the mother of three who left her Ballarat home three weeks ago for a morning run. People just don't disappear without good reason. But now, despite a massive police operation... It's our number one investigation at present. ..and an entire community rallying to find her... I met someone out on the search last week who was in tears out there searching for her. ..there seems faint hope she'll be found alive. This was targeted and seven kilometres in, an incident has happened. So what happened after that and who was involved? I'm still not convinced that we're looking at a homicide. 
Forensic psychologist Dr. Peter Ashker is still considering the alternative possibility that Samantha may have been kidnapped at the seven kilometre point where her digital trail ends. I still would like to believe the very real possibility that it's a kidnapping and that she's still alive and that's my hope. But I absolutely feel that this is whoever has taken her and abducted her, they're very systematic and well organised and very uh, knew very well what they were doing. The kidnap scenario gains added weight with police now indicating they're interested in a vehicle. To veteran detective Damien Merritt, it's vital information. This is so important because they didn't just say a car, they said a damaged car. It's so specific. So was that damage caused with this incident or was that damage uh, because somebody saw a damaged car leave? But both Damien and Valentine Smith believe the role of a vehicle is more likely to remove Samantha's body from the scene. I note that it's a seven and a half K mark turnaround point. I would be very surprised if it didn't take place on or very close to a roadway, which would indicate uh, a vehicle and that she's been removed by at least obviously one person and that there'll be more than that one person that knows what's happened. As we've revealed, the area where Samantha was taken is also pitted with thousands of old mine shafts. Any one of them could be hiding her body. If Samantha Murphy is in a mine shaft in this region, what are the chances of finding her? Probably Buckley's a nun. Police have said all aspects of Samantha Murphy's life are being examined, including, we believe, the car repair business she and her husband Mick own. And all theories are on the table. We look into absolutely every avenue of inquiry and uh, we will continue to do so until we find some answers. Our experts agree this case could well be cracked by the public and police have received over 500 tips so far. Just one of those could provide the final clue investigators need. Cecilia, you're from this community. All of this is grim, but a resolution is important for your community, isn't it? Yeah, and I think that in terms of having a position on what could or couldn't have happened to Sam, I'm in no position to, you know, um, to have a strong one in that, but I am in a position to hold hope. I think where there's a community that's driven by hope, there's still hope out there to bring Samantha home, whether it be a resolution that's, um, you know, not something that we, that we would love, but a resolution that finds, you know, peace in, in our hearts and allows for healing. But I still, um, yeah, I still hold hope and so does the majority of the Ballarat community. Damien Merritt agrees, but he's seen hope dashed in too many cases and he fears with the weeks that have passed, Samantha Murphy's fate has already been sealed. I think we're looking at a homicide that occurred sadly on the uh, 4th of February. And I think uh, through the data, police have a very good idea of exactly what happened. And how important is it to find a body? Oh, very important to find a body. It's always important and it's important for the prosecution case, but it's also more important for the family to be able to, you know, get some closure. That little hope of, oh, they might still be alive is like torture. Yes. Mm. So to have closure by uh, farewelling um, a loved one is, yeah, I mean, it's everything to that family. Well, we're hoping tonight's investigation will assist police by prompting you, our viewers, to report anything you might know. If you have any information, something you've seen, something you might have heard that day, CCTV or dash cam footage, please call Crime Stoppers on 1800 333 000. Or you can contact us at underinvestigation at nine.com.au. Thank you all very much for joining me tonight and I thank you. I'm Liz Hayes.
Good night. Hello, I'm Liz Hayes and thank you for watching Under Investigation. Subscribe to our channel now for exclusive clips and don't miss out on full episodes of Under Investigation on Nine Now and the Nine Now app.